Hello and welcome to DGENs for a Brighter Future. I'm your host, Jorge, and in this video, I interview Crypto Coronado, the CEO of El Dorado. El Dorado is a decentralized exchange that is built on top of both Maya Protocol and Chainflip. This means you can easily swap between assets such as Bitcoin, ETH, Kuji, and Dash, as well as so many other assets that are not wrapped. So it's a truly cross-chain exchange similar to ThorChain. I also want to mention here that uh, Crypto Coronado is incredibly passionate about this technology, and you'll definitely see that in this video. And, uh, you know, this is kind of like the spiritual part two of my interview with Luke Smith from Maya Protocol. So if you haven't seen that video, you should definitely check it out up here. I also want to mention that nothing here is financial advice. I'm not a professional. You should definitely go to a, probably a financial advisor or a lawyer if you're looking for that. This video is just meant to be educational in nature. And I also want to mention that I was not paid nor sponsored to create this video. So keep that in mind as you watch. Anyways, I really appreciate your time and introducing Crypto Coronado. How you doing, buddy? Hey, how we doing today? Um, things are bright and shining in the city, city of gold. Market is pumping. Um, every day feels like, uh, yeah, a new addition on some kind of crazy adventure. And it's fun. I've been here for a couple cycles. So I'm like, every day I wake up just grateful, taking it all in, trying to keep my feet below me. And uh, yeah, it sometimes feels like you're you're running downhill trying to keep your feet underneath you. Great. I mean, yeah, speaking of cycles, this one this one is incredibly explosive. I mean, every I, I can't I feel like every time I open my 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 like wall my uh uh trackers, you know, on the different assets, I feel like I've I don't think I don't know if I'm a genius. I just I just see things going up. It's it's an incredibly exciting time. Uh so the first thing I wanted to ask you before we dive into El Dorado, can, uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, what is your experience in crypto or maybe your background that brought you into the space and how did you end up in El Dorado? Oh, where to begin? So I guess my first uh, dipping of my toe into interacting with blockchains was probably in 2011 or 2012. Um, I was a high schooler um, buying things onto the Silk Road. Um, I was I was that kid at <laughs> high school. Um, so a friend of mine who's actually Korean taught me about using VPNs. He taught me about buying Bitcoin with green dot money packs that you buy at CVS. And, you know, in many ways, that was my crypto onboarding. <clears throat> I won't tell you some story. I hate pet peeve. I hate when people tell you the story about that one time they could have had a lot of Bitcoin, but they threw it away or they lost it or like everybody has one of those in this space. Um, but no, I, uh, using the Silk Road, so that was my first exposure to blockchains. A um, few years later in college, you know, in 2015, 16, 17, I, um, you know, was buying Bitcoin and Ethereum on Coinbase. I was interested in the space. I continued being invested. Um, I then ended up, you know, doing some trading on Binance, and I was trading and invested in the 2016, 17 um, cycle and watched a very small bag for a college kid go up to a pretty solid bag for a kid that age. And there was a point where I was like, I'm going to drop out of school. I'm going to do this professionally. I'm going to be a crypto trader. Uh, and I watched, I rode that cycle all the way up and I rode it all the way down. And uh, so then I was like, all right, I'm going to go get a real job in the real world. So I went and worked in tech and with seed stage startups, um, not just seed stage, but um, I kind of became a generalist first through working for a startup accelerator. So working on small, like single digit number teams, primarily in tech, um, build, scale their products, market. Um, I'm, I'm not a dev, but I um, basically built a toolkit for marketing small companies, for doing outbound sales, for just a number of things. I kind of wore every hat that a small startup might have in a combination of jobs or working on a contract basis for companies that were at an accelerator. Uh, I then went and got an MBA uh, in Austin, Texas. And all the while I've been invested in crypto, interested in it, understood the technology. Um, and I just kind of was on the sidelines with my money, uh, parked into it for let's say 2018, 19, 20. Um, come 2021, I'm out of school. I'm uh, living in Austin, Texas. I'm working as the marketing director for an, a pretty innovative ed tech startup. And again, really into crypto and increasingly my personal circles began to contain people who worked full-time in crypto. And that was like my first exposure. I didn't realize you, like people did that, right? It's like, 
oh, what do you work for Coinbase in San Francisco? Um, and so increasingly, as I met more people that worked full time in the space, one of them sat me down at a party one time and was like, why aren't you doing this full time? And I was like, well, I, I, I had a, kind of an imposter syndrome. And he goes, you have a no code inferiority complex. And he goes, you're, you're running nodes on this network. You're invested here. You've been in this for a couple of years. He goes, I've listened to you talk. You are, you know, as much about crypto as people I work with in crypto. Why don't you try to work in this full time? And he said, you have a no code inferiority complex and you think that you need to be a developer to do this. And he said, he goes, he'd been very successful. He's like a, made a lot of money in crypto. And he was like, he's like, dude, every single founding team needs three of me as in the non-technical who takes the meetings, does the talking, writes the tweets. There's, there are many things. There's a division of labor for a reason. And mm -hmm. he's like, yeah, man, I, he goes, I can't get my devs to get on a partnership meeting and fluently converse about what our product does. Like that's not their role. So I decided I was going to quit my job and either be unemployed or work in crypto. And I quit my job. And three weeks later, I had a full-time job in the ThorChain ecosystem. And so I guess through just kind of personal network in Austin and, um, and luck and chance and divine providence, I ended up working on a cross-chain project in the ThorChain ecosystem as my first job in crypto. Started as a marketing director, worked my way up to COO over the course of the next two years. And then in, this is, let me tell you, kind of a life story here. <laughs> in the fall of 2022, uh, I was uniquely positioned between Maya Protocol and ThorChain. I had met the Maya Protocol team in person. I was the first person who introduced Maya to ThorChain, like the people. Um, they were looking like, hey, we want to meet ThorChain. And they found me first somehow. I was the first node in the network. So I connected them with JP, the founder of ThorChain, or the inventor, really, um, not the founder. But um brokered that deal, was friends really with both sides. And I was like, okay, so between the two, there needs to be a space for these cross-chain products that combine the features and technology of both. And I found myself like increasingly like, no, like I'm uniquely situated to found this company between these two platforms and, and related ones and understand the landscape and really, really build a, a formidable product in cross-chain DeFi. So that's my story. That's how I got there. Um, I basically spent all of my time in crypto in cross chain. So like I never worked for a strictly EVM project. I never worked in the Cosmos ecosystem. It was ThorChain ecosystem all along. Then now Maya protocol and chain flip. But uh, I guess you could call me a cross chain native. So there's my, uh, wasn't quite an, if that was an elevator pitch, it's a long elevator. <laughs> no, but I think, I think it kind of describes you really well. I think like, you know, there's, it's easy for so many people to become siloed into the environment that they're used to in the crypto space. I was actually at ETH Denver. And when I was there, I actually met a guy that's like, I don't really think about like crypto or anything. I just kind of think of what's going on in ETH. I don't think about price. I just think about how much ETH I could get. And I think more and more it, it's becoming clear that I think the industry is going to be multiple chains communicating with one another. Some will have their own use cases or app, you know, their hit application, if you will. And so I think the, the cross chain tech is incredibly important. I'm a bit of a ThorChain fan myself and, you know, Maya and Chainflip and, you know, having you on is really exciting. Uh, so what I wanted to ask you next is there might be someone who uses ThorSwap frequently. Uh, is maybe somewhat familiarized with uh, Maya and Chainflip. So where does El Dorado come into the fold? Yeah, so um, we started as the first native Maya-only front end. So we are a cross-chain platform. I always say um, these things are very simple. We provide swapping, we provide yield, and we provide on and off ramping. Those are the three pillars of our service. You get your money in and out of crypto with the on-ramp. You can get yield with our liquidity pools. That's the APRs. Um, we call them yield accounts. Uh, more on this another time, but we're, we're trying to move away from in-group, hard-to-grasp language like LPing. It's a yield account. Why is it a yield account? Because yield account makes sense to the average person. It's intuitive, right? It's an account mm -hmm. that gets yield. Uh, how that works, we can explain more. It is an LP, but um, so there is on and off ramping. There are yield accounts, and then there is swapping between assets. Um, in order to do that, you used to have to go, those three things, you used to have to go to a centralized exchange. 
And the reason for that up until this cycle is that it hadn't technically been figured out how to do multi-asset L1 cross-chain swapping and yields and things like that um, in a decentralized way. You had to trust these FDXs and Celsiuses and Coinbases, and that went really poorly for a lot of people. So mm -hmm. the good news that we're sharing is it has been technically figured out how to do it on a decentralized backend. And we are offering that as our front end. So we are a front end. Think of it like, here's our service. And that front end is has injections, right? It has these like back end injections. And there are two of them right now. And there's two more that are going to be live. Um, the first one was Maya protocol. And so Maya is through our front end, you interface with Maya protocol. And that is what performs the swap or allows you to get the yield. Uh, now we have chain flip integrated, same thing. So there's those two back ends. Next, we're going to have Rango and Thorchain. Uh, Rango being more of an aggregator and Thorchain being another cross-chain liquidity protocol. Um, at that point where we have these four strings of injection, like feeding our front end, you're going to be able to swap between chains and assets in a, a, in a non-custodial way. You don't have to go into our system at all, right? You plug in your wallet. It performs the operation. The swap happens and it's still in your wallet. Like the Bitcoin goes to ETH and it's in your wallet. Uh, we don't own anything. We couldn't run away with anything because it's your wallet. So um, Rango, Thorchain, Chainflip, and Maya Protocol are the backends that enable that. So as we integrate more and more backends and sort of uh, technologies that allow us to deliver these services, we end up with this like array of features that I argue combines the best aspects of those backends. So when or if Thorchain integrates Solana or Maya Protocol integrates Zcash, which is coming. Mm -hmm. uh, things like that, we get to update and then we get to offer Zcash on our platform to people cross-chain through our front end. So I think of this as we are building like a full suite personal finance product that should compete feature for feature with a centralized exchange. No ifs, ands, or buts, or like, like oh, but harder UI, or oh, but fewer asset selection, or bad gas, or anything like that. We need to compete with them in terms of speed, efficiency, asset um, selection, and <clears throat> gas costs, things like that. So we are trying to build that in the most efficient way possible. And by having multiple backends, we're able to deliver those features in the most efficient way possible. Um, and our competitive advantage is that versus other people that might be doing this is we are going to pick a novel combination of those features and of those backends and of other add-ons and things we want to do. Um, that will give the suite of El Dorado like offerings, it will make that unique. So um, we currently have a plugin for an on-ramp. It's called Cato Money. It's a centralized on and off ramp. So you have to give a photo ID. It's KYC. Other than that, not other than our Cato Money plugin, there's no KYC or any sort of tracking to use our platform. Uh, we plan in the future, we're going to integrate another on and off ramp that is peer to peer. What does that mean? No KYC, no paper trail you go into this order book and somebody has said, I have $2,000 in Bitcoin, I want $2,000 in cash. Uh, they are able to send that into a smart contract. Actually, they probably have to switch out of Bitcoin into a stable, but like they switch it into USDC. That USDC goes into a 24 hour escrow smart contract. And I, I have my funds in the escrow. You send $2,000 to my bank account. We both sign, I release those funds, and we have just done an untraceable peer-to-peer -peer transaction to get um, my funds out of the crypto worlds and your funds in. So like that sort of thing, like we don't know of a single other protocol that has considered that. And some might call it a little degen. We think it's, we have this purest ethos of like peer-to-peer -peer commerce. This is like, you have a, you have a God-given right to do business with other human beings that you interact with in the world. And nobody has the right to take that from you. And uh, you know, one day I plan to find a off-ramp partner that is a human being who wants to give me uh, one kilogram gold bricks for my Bitcoin. And those <laughs> one kilogram bricks, dead serious, are currently worth $66,000 a piece. So I'm thinking that I need 21 of them. And with 21 of them, I can go buy a house. And I already talked to a guy locally here who will sell me his house for those 21 gold bricks. I like to think about my use case. I'm building the product that I need to exist. I need to cultivate and grow my value. I'm going to do that with crypto. I get paid on the crypto side. I'm going to find a person to exchange that crypto for gold with in some sort of semi-secure way. There'll be some risk because this is taking banking into your own hands. Uh, and then I'm going to go find a peer-to-peer -peer transaction for a piece of property 
And I'm the use case, right? I'm scale that interaction out over the entire economy. This is how we should be doing commerce. Um, and so, yes, we're using shiny technology, but this is, that's a story as old as time and as old as like, you know, written language back to ancient Akkad uh, in terms of how people transact, store and exchange. So I'm very optimistic about it. I'm an idealist about uh, what we can create with a true peer to peer economy. And uh, I would hope that I'm building a tool that is going to empower people to, uh, yeah, take their finances into their own hands, which also means the freedom to make bad decisions. Like that's part of peer to peer and true self custody finance is uh, the freedom to make bad decisions right. and also. I think with or without a bank, you know, you could still make tons of bad decisions. I just like to, <laughs> I just like to add that on there. Uh, but there's a lot. A lot you just said, a lot to touch on. So I'm going to try to break it down one by one. So yeah. if I'm understanding you correctly, then the overarching goal for El Dorado is to kind of be like a, a true competitor to a centralized exchange. It's just a one-stop shop to do your swaps, custody your own assets, while also being able to find other products like, uh, like earning, LPing or, or as you mentioned, like dual, I think it's uh, uh, savings, uh, like savings products, if you will. And I understand uh, where you're coming from. Obviously a challenge in the crypto space is to onboard more people into crypto and using language that can come off as ostentatious, you know, to, to the new user might put them off, right? So, Am I, am I understanding you correctly there? Is that what the goal of Eldorado is to be? Absolutely. And um, we're trying to think big. You know, I, I like to consider that our offerings are some combination of the functions someone might otherwise be using a SEX for, a centralized exchange. They could also be using a DEX. They could also be using a bank, right? And it depends which of our features we're talking about. So where do you go to check your financial health? It might be your bank, it might be your credit card company, it might be your crypto portfolio, I don't know. But the question becomes, if we offer all three of those things, like checking your financial health, if we have great portfolio tracking, chart tracking, um, it could be that our killer use case is that we are like your financial home, or we're, we are where you go to check your financial health, um, assuming that you're, you're you know interfacing with and storing some portion of them in digital assets. Uh, that said, it is also possible that we're just replacing your Coinbase or your Robinhood. We have, you know, one of the big problems we're seeing these past two weeks, Coinbase has been shutting off Bitcoin buys when it dips. That is, whether it's through, they say, oh, we had a 10x in volume increase, so you couldn't buy the dip. Whether that's true and it's in good faith or whether it is they're shut it down because they don't want you to buy the dip, I don't care. Those sorts of outages are, are intolerable. It's unacceptable. You should be on our platform. Mm -hmm. Our unwraps never turn off like that. And um, yeah, you can't trust these big centralized entities. So um, what we're really talking about here is product market fit. And I am open to the possibility that I don't know for sure what my product market fit will be. I have ideas, right? I'd like this to be kind of a personal finance suite. Mm -hmm. I'd like people to f track their financial health and do their exchanging. But um, we're going to build out all these cool features. We're going to build the product that we want to see in the world and let the market decide how they want to use it. Um, and I'm I kind of come with the approach that you have to be open to the idea that the market is going to use your product in a way you didn't anticipate. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I was just listening uh, to the All In podcast, right? And I I, I, I love Jason Calacanis. Uh, I also kind of enjoy when he's wrong. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I thought what was really interesting that they were pointing out is that Bitcoin has found its its own value like uh, as a store of value as opposed to maybe the original idea, which might have been a currency. And that could still happen. It's like you're I, saying, like the product market fit can change over time as people find a different use case for the technology. I, I always like, like to point that out to you people, have to like especially ready to change shapes. Right? Yeah, especially with normies and friends who are not in crypto, I like to point out, and this is an interesting framing thing, we should stop using the word cryptocurrency. Uh, and the reason is that when people hear cryptocurrency, they think that, I mean, if they know nothing, they're like, oh, you're trying to replace the dollar. Cryptocurrency, right? And then you have to explain, oh, no, no, you don't understand. Bitcoin, Bitcoin had a number of proposed use cases 
one of them being a, a means of transaction, right? That's cash. The other being a store of value. Oversimplification, but store of value, value proposition has won, right? Nobody is trying to buy coffee with Bitcoin. There aren't even communities that think that's true. If anything, these splinter off communities like Dash or Litecoin or whatever are the ones that care about that. Um, so the average person doesn't realize that the replacing the dollar as a means of transaction is no longer, that's not, that's not the proposed Bitcoin use case anymore. That fight's over. Um, the problem is by calling all of these things cryptocurrencies, I mean, here's a really unpopular take and that you should maybe we shouldn't do this, but like, most tokens should be called a crypto equity, right? Because it, to the average person, they're like, cryptocurrency, are you placing the dollar? No, we're not. So what is it? Well, it acts kind of like stock in a company. It's like, okay, that's a crypto equity. <laughs> but we're not quite, quite ready for that linguistically. Um, in any case, I do think that, um, yeah, it's important to come back to, I really, my first principles approach to like assets generally is, the end goal for me is to have, I like to say, a million people who are managing their financial lives at El Dorado, and they're citizens of our city of gold. We're going to make this like a rich and immersive, fun, like, we're not going to sanitize our design. People don't, people are like, you look like a scam. It's like, no, you're just used to designs that are not fun at all. <laughs> we're not going to become like a, a really sanitized, boring interface. We want this to be like an immersive experience. It's almost video gamey. Uh, where you do come and deal in real assets and manage your financial life, but it has a sense of humor and experience. But my end goal is 1 million people with Bitcoin savings accounts or B maybe Bitcoin yield accounts. Now, I'm calling them that tactfully because those are words the average person understands, right? Um, if I said Bitcoin liquidity positions, I lost, I lost my parents there. I lost my cousins. I lost anybody who's normal who needs this explanation, I lost them there, right? That's too much. Um, a yield account or a savings account is intuitive and people understand it. So for to get a million people doing this, they need to understand it in terms where we meet them halfway. But it does all come back to the assumption that Bitcoin is the best store of value. It is hard money. Uh, we believe that as a team, we have this, it's kind of one of these like inclusive, we are maxis to, to some degree, but it's also, um, while keeping in mind there, there are other great assets that one can and should own. It's a, it's a yes and approach. Um, but yeah, really just bringing it back to like Bitcoin is the thing that we should all want. And I never considered this like a revolution in my thinking, but a big revolution for anybody who's interacted with crypto before that I think a lot of people are going to hit in the next year is the difference between I own crypto to trade into more dollars versus I own dollars to buy more crypto and the long-term goal is a big bag of Bitcoin that I pass on or that I buy a house with. Um, that is a serious, like treating it like a store, true store of value and not an investment is actually a huge psychological leap to take. And you see the world differently and you see your finances differently when you realize like, no, what I'm playing for is more on the blockchain side, not to multiply on the blockchain side and pass it back to the fiat side because at current inflation rates, and this is, I'm very passionate about inflation, you're going to lose half of your spending power every nine years. That's horrible. That's catastrophic. That's right. The, the people yeah. doing that should go to jail, but that's another topic. Yeah. I mean, this is a crypto show, so yeah, <laughs> you're not going to get a lot of people disagreeing with you there, but, uh, I do think that you bring up a really interesting point here. It's the psychological leap to, to, to make. And I think that maybe our grandparents before were more entwined with the idea that I, I bought a nice watch or I bought a, a bar of gold or, you know, something like that. And that helped me store value or, or a house, which is the literal, <laughs> like for many people, that's the investment thesis. It's like this house will appreciate in value over time. I can sell this yep. to someone else, pass it to my children. So, I think that's an interesting point in terms of the area of education that we have to work on. So the next thing I wanted to touch on, I, I... Okay, so um, the other part is that you can't live in numbers on a screen. So I said my thesis is that at the end of the day, everyone should want a Bitcoin savings account. Yes, you cannot live in numbers on a screen. You can also not 
uh, eat numbers on a screen. So the extension of that is eventually, and this is where like, I would build this into my platform. I would integrate this, but crypto backed mortgages are already a thing in parts of Texas. Um, you can lock Bitcoin in place and borrow against it. And there is a company that will give you a mortgage. That's enormous. So then figuring out how does this get into the real world? How does this improve your ability to, yeah, to be financially sovereign and, and live in the real world? Um, that's an important like next step, which I mean, to criticize my competition, I think, you know, a lot of them don't even have on and off ramps. Then beyond that, a lot of them don't have on and off ramps. And then they would never think as big as to do like holistic net worth tracking or anything like that. Um, in addition to, you know, having plugins for crypto backed mortgages, like to me, at least that's very broad appeal product building versus we're going to be the best cross chain techs for DeFi people that like, you know, day trading crypto and have been around for two market cycles. Like I could actually probably make more money targeting that customer. And I think I would do less good. And so I'm not doing that. I want to target people who are going to, I always say like the, the best customer for me is literally the person who makes their first wallet to use Eldorado to interact with blockchains and to get their fiat out of the, um, out of the state system, um, and onto, onto blockchain rails. And guess what? It's more likely that they only do that with 500 bucks than if they're a day trader who's pushing 20 K around. And I still care about that person more because that's what I'm in this for. I'm in this to help people, um, get some of their savings out of the system. Ideally, Hey, they become a, one of those people who's pushing big bags around in crypto, but, uh, yeah, you know, I think that for adoption, you really have to go do, do layman's work, trying to, uh, convert people. And, um, yeah, that's really, that's, that's what gets me going. It gets me excited too. I like, like helping people make their first wallet, understand cross chain and, uh, really, really on board. I see. And so one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, obviously Eldorado's a front end, and then there's all these protocols that are working on the back end. So you have the, uh, you have the savers product on Eldorado. I was hoping you can go into a little more detail, like how, how do you manage that product? Is it, is it that Maya or chain flip on the back end is offering that product and you guys are kind of routing it to that product or, or to those protocols? Yeah. So here's the easiest way to understand it is that there are, um, getting this camera on. There are two types of um, long-term positions you can take at Eldorado for now. Um, our savers are actually not quite live yet. We need uh, my protocol to push that development live. So, so some of our updates and like innovations, we have to wait on our back end to do their roadmap updates for us to integrate mm -hmm. on the front end. Um, so in the case of that Maya savers product, uh, Thorchain has them too. Um, these are yield accounts. And I really do like this rebranding for us of yield accounts. They're liquidity positions, but we're calling them yield accounts because that's what they are. They're accounts that get yield. Um, so the way that it works is you can either contribute to, <coughs> excuse me. Um, um, so if you go into a normal liquidity pool, you are getting on my protocol, you are getting exposure to two assets. So let's say you contribute Bitcoin and cacao. That means you're exposed to that Bitcoin and cacao in a 50, 50 ratio. You can also contribute just Bitcoin to that same yield account. And on the back end, it will swap half your Bitcoin for cacao, giving you equally similar, like you still have uh, exposure to the two assets. What that means is that you're in the pool providing liquidity. Um, your APR is the backwards looking 30 day average of transaction fees taken in the pool that gets distributed to you. So very simple. If there's no volume, there's no APR. Um, big lesson from crypto. If anybody promises you a steady APR, question that person. There is no such thing as a free lunch. There should be no steady APRs. Um, if the APR is steady, it means they're steadily inflating their token or they're steadily, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul. Never trust the steady um, uh, steady APR. So ours are variable mm -hmm. and it's a backwards state, a 30 day moving average. And in some pools, like when Kujira went live on Maya protocol, and it was tons of volume. 
the APR for that pool was 574% uh, annual. So like really great, what seems like yield farming rates, but there's no inflation of the token. That was just from volume. Right. So um, all that's to say, that is how supplying liquidity works in terms of getting yield in a yield account at Eldorado through Maya protocol. And there is a safer version of that in which you only supply one asset and you do not get exposure to the other asset, the cacao, and that is called savers. So uh, we might call these savers or savers vaults. We might do a little bit of rebranding. Uh, the bottom line there is it is safer than the former option that I just outlined because you are not getting two asset exposure. You don't have to be exposed to cacao at all. What that means is someone else some in another place is fronting the cacao to fill the other side of your liquidity position. Because they are taking the risk of exposing themselves to cacao, you have to split the yield with them. So the simple way to think of this is you have a slightly more, more risky pool position that might get, let's say, a 14% APR, right? And then you have a mm -hmm. um, safer one that's single asset, but it gets half the yield. So it'd be a 14% and a 7%. You could choose between those depending on your risk preference and risk mm -hmm. tolerance. Uh, and those rates will be de determined by Maya. Uh, we are up, uh, integrating ThorChain in the next month. When we have ThorChain integrated, you can also use savers on ThorChain, which will have their own rates, but a similar structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's awesome. So you're gonna, so you're basically gonna offer the the products based on what the backends are offering. So Correct. if you integrate ThorChain, does that mean you're also gonna have lending? That's a good question. Um, I believe so. Um, we we had this interesting question from an investor, which is, do we plan to go the CD Fi route and integrate more, you know, things like banks and more formal lending hubs and stuff? We want to stay on the decentralized side. We want to stick to our values. There are other products like ours that are really going the, the normie TradFi route or the CD Fi route. We want to stay really decentralized. So something like ThorChain with its overcut collateralized lending is something we probably will offer, um, but we really want to stick to, yeah, stick to really the decentralized side of our, our values and our branding and kind of our messaging. Um, and so in, in so doing, we will not be integrating anything that's too centralized. Um, so yes, that that is on the roadmap. We first need to just get ThorChain integrated. Um, <clears throat> and again, who knows which one of these product offerings is going to be the most sticky with our user base we're really interested right now mm -hmm. if i'm being honest behind under the kimono uh, we're mostly a swaps platform that's basically people come to us because they want to do swaps um, and a lot of that volume is coming for cacao and kuji and the reason is because those are both early assets they're hot they're popular they're chugging and uh there's not a lot of places you can get so we are proud to offer those and uh, that's kind of our our prime product offering right now Gotcha. Gotcha. And I mean, what's really cool about having all these different backends over time is that there's more, there's more assets that you can asset versus uh, access versus going to each of these platforms individually, you know? So, I yep. mean, that's going to be very helpful in the long term. Um, and so that's, that's really cool. And one thing that I think is very interesting since you have Maya on the back end is that you have access to dash. So there's some more privacy involved, right? So I noticed you touched a lot on privacy. I wanted to ask you, as, a, as someone that works in a team uh, within the crypto space, I always hear a different thought process on privacy. I actually asked Chad this question before, and so I just wanted to ask you, tell me uh, what is the importance of privacy within the crypto space and how anxious are you to uh, add more uh, or see more privacy tokens added into uh, these protocols? And what do you think it means for them? Um, so I think that like privacy and um, I see privacy as akin to like autonomy. It's, it's, it's really like a God-given right. It is your right to be able to do things that only you know about um, or that um, the government can't watch or that corporations can't track. And uh, in a world of decreasing privacy generally, I mean, you know, like your social media apps know when you're sleeping and when you're in the bathroom, mm -hmm. like it's, it's dystopian. 
uh, and so does the government if they so choose. So I think that privacy is very important. People a lot of times are like, they look at the cool tokens and cacao and Kuji and stuff that uh, Maya offers, and they're like, why did they add Dash? And what people don't realize is they added Dash because Dash is a sne sneaky way to get more privacy onto the protocol. Um, people don't think of Dash that way who aren't familiar with it. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, overall, especially if my protocol is going to integrate Zcash, which I don't think has formally been announced, but that's the whisper. Um, there is a core ethos around Thorchain and around Maya that everyone should be allowed to transact trustlessly in a decentralized and permissionless manner where you have control of your keys and that you have some privacy. And, um, you know, if you read a really interesting thing in the most recent Satoshi drops, right, they found, uh, they released more of Satoshi's old emails. He, he basically admitted that like, oh, this will become, this will not be anonymous. Bitcoin will not be anonymous because of the nature of how this, um, blockchain is set up, it will be trackable, right? It's not an anonymous thing. That's where, that's where Normie's misunderstanding about like, oh, uh, Bitcoin is for criminals. It's like, no, it's not. It's very trackable. Um, that said, I do think there should be privacy options and you should be able to uh, transmit and store value in a sovereign way. And I don't believe the government has been granted the right to stop you or to monitor you um, or to really um, butt into your life in a way that is intrusive. Um, and so obviously the question there, everyone thinks that to some degree, but the question is, uh, what is the degree and what is the scale and what is the extent of personal privacy and freedom? You know, I think we're going to find out. I think that this this technology mm -hmm. is liberating. It allows you to operate uh, outside the system with sovereignty. Um, we kind of had a, a line which is self-sovereign finance. And I'm not sure if we're going to keep that, but uh, we would use that to describe our product. What do we do? We, we, do, we work in self-sovereign finance. Um, so I think that privacy as an option is very important. And ultimately, the track of human existence and civilization would appear to indicate that you should not trust governments, right? Like that's, it's very hard for me. I, I, I have an undergraduate history degree. It's very hard for me to look at history and make a good faith argument to someone that you should trust your government. I um, mean, it, it's like a almost universal that governments become corrupt. They become overreaching. They became fi become financially manipulative. They then become financially corrupt, and they then fall. Uh, and so, not to get into like broader strokes about the financial state of Western civilization and and where that's going to be going, but um, our our civil the civilization in which I live and operate is not in good financial health. Um, the currency isn't sound, and I'm just thankful that there are alternatives. And I'm thankful that um, I get to access those alternatives because I'm early. Uh, and in building this product, I'm trying to give other people access to those alternatives. Uh, and that is both the storing and transmission of value, right, which is the, the essence of commerce, but also the ability to um, have a private treasury, right, to have a personal treasury that is yours and that you truly control. Uh, and whether it's the government or the banks, depends who you want to blame. The fact that I can't go get more than $10,000 out of my bank account today for any reason, whether that was because I have to pay a freaking somebody kidnapped a family member and I need to pay them or like if um, I want to go buy a house or I want to buy something for cash or I want to, I want to, I just feel like transferring all of my money to my girlfriend because she needs to do something with that. I can't do that. The bank will not let me do that. So that is not really my money. Uh, you can blame the bank, you can blame the government, exactly. but if you cannot move all of your money on a whim to your friend, that's not your money. That's, that's you own an IOU from a bank. And we know from bank runs and from financial history and from like freaking the collateralization of banks, we know that that's fake and the money isn't there. And that um, we should all feel deceived and lied to by the system in place. And um, once you open your eyes to the fact that you can truly have this self-sovereign finance, I really think there's no going back. And it's it's almost terrifying because if too many people realize this at the same time, it's going to crash the system. Uh, if too many people start doing what I'm doing and how like how I outlined, I'm going to um, get paid in crypto, work on this side of things. You know, I write tweets. I'm basically a consultant. Um, I then am going to find somebody who will take 
Bitcoin for gold. I'm going to take that gold and I'm going to buy a house. And that's all my own business. And that's all private. Um, if you scale that out to the economy, we're going to have some pretty radical changes in the structure of um of markets and of finance and of how people are able to live their lives, I think it's going to cut out a lot of bloat and inefficiency and lead to a lot more human flourishing. But that will come at the cost of institutions that were set up in the old mold. So what that world looks like, I don't know. Uh, I'm accelerating towards it. No, and and, and I think uh, I think that there is. So, like nas both national but individual sovereignty as well. I mean, being freedom is is an asset is in itself. You know, your ability to live freely is incredibly important. So I think I think you did a really good job of illustrating that. Uh, I wanted to also ask you. So, am I correct in saying this? So Maya is bringing on Arbitrum as an asset. No, correct. It's looking like Arbitrum, so, Cardano, Zcash. Uh, there's a number of other ones. Maybe Radix or Caspa. Um, all of these are kind of unofficial and, and a little bit of hearsay. We know that Arbitrum is the next one. That is confirmed, and we are waiting on that to go live. So uh, the reason I ask this is because I think, in general, there <laughs> most people who, ha at least in my experience, I could be totally wrong, but in my experience, it, you know, even going to conferences, most people who have ETH don't ever like to use it the fees are insane so i'm not here to evangelize the the layer twos but rather i wanted to ask if if arbitrum is brought on does that mean that say eth on arbitrum uh usdc on arbitrum like uh, you know kind of or usdt on arbitrum would those be accessible on el dorado like yep so that way totally. you can transfer in and out of those assets and have lower fees yep to totally and like if Arbitrum is the strong horse in about the next two months when we choose to launch our token, we might launch it on Arbitrum. Um, we're really going to see like what's getting the most usage, what seems like the best long-term viable strategy. Um, Ar Arbitrum is mm -hmm. reputable. It's been very functional. It has a really a dynamo development community. And uh, yeah, we're, it's a strong candidate for where we might may launch our token. Um, but yeah, we're going to be able to offer all those Arbitrum assets. And again, you could almost think about, right? So we are this front end. We have these back end injections. We have four of them. Now think about each of those constituent back ends. Each of those back ends has these chains, right? And those are their back ends. So like Maya protocol integrating Arbitrum, it's it's a back end to one of our back ends and essentially massively expands our ability to do, again, bringing it back to the core premise of what do we offer? Delivering high quality products and services through our front end to our users. Um, my goal is that they don't know which backend they're using. I mean, they, they can check, but like my goal is that you get, you get your assets fast and cheap. You get the assets that you want. You're able to store them, grow them, swap them, trade them. Mm -hmm. Um, and you do that in a fast and decentralized and secure way through our various procurement of that, right? You don't, um, at least most people, when you go to the grocery store, you don't really care like which trucking company brought in the produce. You want it to be high quality produce. Right. You want it to be fresh. You want it to be fast. You want it to be fairly affordable. But like which truck brought it in doesn't matter as much. Um, you might care about the farm. But um, yeah, so we are a supermarket in some sense who is getting a network of suppliers. And as that network grows, those networks uh, get to compete against each other. And that ultimately brings the highest quality product to our shelves, to our front end, to our customers. Right. I mean, for me, that's that's very exciting. That's going to make uh, using using my ETH on El Dorado a lot easier. So that's going to be exciting. Uh, do you mind me asking? So I normally don't uh, dive into tokens on this channel, but uh, I was curious to ask you. So I've noticed there's a lot of people in your community that are really excited for this airdrop. What can they do if if they want to participate and then the second thing I wanted to ask you is to describe the the token and what what are going to be the use cases for the token, the Eldo token. Yeah, so this is a um, simple answer. I always tell people this is kind of unfair, but oh, what what? Uh, how do you get our airdrop? And I say, uh, use your imagination. As in, uh, we are a protocol. We have three things you can do on our platform. If you've done all three of those things, 
that's a good way. That's a good way to ensure that you check the box. You did the things on our platform, right? That is on and off ramping. That is swapping, and that is LPing. Beyond that, um, we our token is going to represent a fractional piece of our whole model and all the things we're involved with, and that includes all of our backends. Um, so there's going to be a proportional airdropping of revenue to the token. Um, it's not a security. It doesn't get sent that in a security manner, but holding the token means that there will be airdrops of our revenue uh, that are pro rata. It's literally owning the volume that passes over our platform. It's very simple. Uh, and this isn't like ThorSwap that does like 60% or 70% of revenue. It's all of the revenue. All of the revenue goes pro rata to token holders. And that means that you have an asset that is generating multiple other assets. Uh, right now, with a Maya backend and a Chainflip backend, uh, the Eldo token will generate cacao, um, pretty solid amounts of cacao um, in from Maya. The volume that comes from Chainflip, that is in like the in-kind assets. So um, that's in Bitcoin, that's in USDC. Whatever's being transacted from Chainflip, that's what the transaction fees are in. Um, so what you end up with is an asset that will be accrued airdrops of kind of a nice smorgasbord or an index of everything that passes over our platform. And we're designing an asset, and this is like truthful, we we plan to have the team tokens basically entirely locked. We're not going to be able to sell them. We're not going to be able to dump them. What does that mean? We have to design an asset that I want to hold for five or 10 years. Ideally, I want that asset to be something that generates stuff, right? And that isn't part of some Ponzi-nomic scheme that is only good for one cycle. Um, so, so long as there is volume, there will be revenue for Eldorado. So long as there is revenue, there will be these airdrops of pro rata revenue to the token. Um, that's our high high strokes thing. I believe we've seen a complexity bubble in the past the past cycle with crazy pumponomics token schemes and like really esoteric heady revenue models. And it's like, no, nobody is reinventing the wheel here. I, uh, I had a great business school teacher who used to say, there are about eight business models. And you might invent a new product. You might find a new market. You're basically going to fall into the category of one of these eight business models. If you catch yourself telling yourself you invented a new business model, you should check yourself because you are probably arrogant and wrong. Um, somebody has run this business model before, and you might have a novel product using that business model, but there are not, there basically aren't business new business models under the sun. So keeping that in mind, um, we're taking it back to the basics. We do some combination of exchanging and of sort of banking, uh, though we are not a bank or an exchange. Um, mm -hmm. And we are offering, yeah, personal finance management. So that includes a number of things. Um, ultimately, the volume and the utilization of our platform will generate revenue. That revenue uh, will accrue to the Eldo token in pro rata amounts. And that's the long and short of it. Um, we think that there are a lot of precedents in tokenomics and in token design and framing and launching that are frankly stupid. And it's like, oh no, this is the precedent. Just because something is the way people do it in crypto does not mean it's a good idea. Most of these precedents are three years old. Could you imagine in like another industry saying like, no, no, no this is what everyone does. And it's like, okay, when did they start doing that? Three years ago. It's, it's, there's been so little data um, that actually, I think this is basically my hypothesis is like, most tokenomic schemes are very short-lived. They're for quick exits. And most of those builders do not plan to be working on their current project in the next cycle or in 10 years. My co-founder and I are childhood friends. Right. Um, he's, a, right. he's a big brain, you know, he's a, a master's degrees in computer science and physics from UPenn. Um, he's our CTO, he's a phenom there. He and I plan to be building this company for the next decade of our lives. We're setting up our lives to do this accordingly. Um, this token, is not about selling the top in freaking January of 2025. Um, this is about creating a long-term um, stakeholder tool for people to have stake on some level in our protocol. And yes, it will be fungible, but the primary value proposition is not the fungibility or speculative value. It is the literal owning of a fraction of all of the dealings of Eldorado. And uh, to some people that is appealing and to the right people that will be appealing and to those who is, do not find it appealing, that's fine. We don't want them buying. We don't want them pumping and dumping us. Um, so by kind of having an anti, anti tokenomics pump ethos, we think we can build a long-term asset and coming always back to, it is not about the token, right? It is about our protocol. It is about our model. If we have a sound model, 
we have a sound token, but the model comes first. Many of these freaking companies have tokens and they didn't figure out like, do you have a profitable revenue model? Like, do you generate money that is above your costs long-term? Like a lot of like, seems very stupid in the business world, but if you built an unprofitable company, mm -hmm. how could you expect to have a profitable token? Um, the answer is if you have stupid pumponomics or weird like gaming the system and that's all short lived. So fundamental revenue model and platform first will provide for a fundamentally um, long-term appreciating solid blue chip ELDO asset. And ELDO is gonna be our ticker. We're still deciding the location on it, but yeah, using our platform um, and just generally interfacing with us is how you're gonna get the airdrop. Uh, beyond that, mm -hmm. for people who want to promote, uh, promote Eldorado, just talk about how they use it and really be honest promoters of like, hey, I manage my, my financial life here. Um, we will have airdrop deals for those people. If anyone listening would like to reach out and be a part of that, um, we are not paying shills behind the scenes. It's more of a public affiliation. Like, hey, if you genuinely use our platform, we will reward you for that. And if you genuinely want to promote our platform in the future, um, we will also compensate you for that. So we are playing everything with kind of an open kimono. We want people to know exactly how we're approaching this. Um, no shady deals. No sketchy pumponomics and no big bag of team tokens that are going to be dumped on our community. As an aside, we have not a single VC on our cap table. Um, I did not let anyone invest more than $50,000 worth of uh, funds in our protocol. So nobody owns a large enough share to screw anybody else over. Um, to me, that was a risk thing. It decentralizes our risk. We're funded by a bunch of small angels, and I'm proud of that. Uh, if somebody you know had a million dollars in us, they could hypothetically, with some vesting schedule, dump a lot of tokens and nobody has that power over our protocol or our future token. Awesome. So, uh, Hey, I think, uh, I think we've had an amazing conversation. I, I really appreciate all the information. I think my viewers will too. I wanted to let you off on this note and I wanted to give you one final question. So cross chain technology, adds a layer of sovereignty and freedom to the user, right? Um, what do you think is going to be the biggest challenge uh, for Eldorado or maybe for the cross-chain space in general going forward? Um, I think it's going to be getting the message out in terms that are widely understandable. Um, I think that we have a bad habit of in-group language and sticking to like kind of esoteric, uh, the obscure language that is hard to grasp for the average person. And that works if you're fighting over the current DeFi pie or even within crypto, like the current cross-chain pie. Uh, but we really need to be thinking bigger and um, adapting to the truth that if we don't do a good job of uh, getting the word out about our decentralized tech, Coinbase is going to gobble up the tens or hundreds of millions of people who will come into web three in this next cycle. So we need to um, get over ourselves to some degree, right? We need to uh, understand that uh, having kind of a disdain or an eliteness because we've been in this longer and we know what we're talking about in the crypto beat. Uh, that is limiting, mm -hmm. that is a limiting mindset and that's limiting behavior. And uh, if you are not willing to reach to the level of normies and trying to get them um, on board with things they've never heard of and don't understand and explain them carefully, um, you are competing over a limited pie that is not growing very fast. So my vision is to get new entrants into the space um, directly, not, not getting into Coinbase and then getting into us, getting them directly into um, cross-chain tech. And whether they even call it that, it does not matter to me. I want them using our platform, getting the benefits and managing their financial lives with self-custody and self-sovereignty. Um, that's what's most important to me. And in order to do that, we need to be open-minded and welcoming to a large degree. So we wanna spearhead that effort. We're gonna be doing um, a lot of more traditional marketing behaviors that I think a lot of, especially DeFi protocols don't do. And uh, that's all for the purpose of, um, yeah, welcoming people to this space. I like to think kind of in a bright way, but also a bleak way that we are gonna be welcoming financial refugees from the fiat system and from the dollar. Um, there already are financial refugees from Venezuela and Argentina and places where hyperinflation is, is really bad. Um, I think we're going to see that more in the bigger developed Western countries in the next year or two. Um, so 
We want them to know that there is a refuge. We have the City of Gold. We have El Dorado. Uh, it's a place where you can swap, store, and transmit value uh, and truly own your own value, your keys, your, your personal treasury. So we're extremely excited about that and thinking of innovative ways that we can get those people uh, from zero to one in creating that first wallet at Eldorado.market. Awesome. Hey, I love it. Anyways, hey, uh, thank you so much for your time. If you guys haven't, make sure you go on Twitter, follow Crypto Coronado and El Dorado so you can find more information. All the links will be down below, and uh, I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you enjoy this content. I really do appreciate it. It helps me continue to do this all the time, which is something that I'm very passionate about. And uh, also, if you haven't, check out my last video with Neon EVM. It was extremely interesting with Francis Munoz. Awesome video. And if you want, you can also check out my interview with Aluk Smith from Maya Protocol. It's a little old, but it's still very pertinent to the protocol today. So you'll definitely enjoy it. Anyways, DGEN safely.